feels the stress, the concern. Pray that you would bless each of the students. All of us have family, friends, relatives we're concerned about. We pray that you would work in their lives and draw them to you, those that don't know you, Lord. Help us to become equipped so that we can not only live the way you want us to live, that we'll have biblical answers to people who ask about the subject matter, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Okay, today is the 29th, and we're still reviewing biblical terms and definitions for holiness and sanctification. I am now receiving from my online students the exit exam, the exit, uh, not exam, the exit um, measurement. You asked, you were asked to answer eight questions or so when you started this class, and then at the end you will be asked to answer those eight questions again off the top of your head. And for some of my students, they have noticeably developed their knowledge. Others, you would think they never took my class. And that's discouraging to me when I ask, uh, you know, what is the meaning of holiness? And then people after the class are telling me that it's uh, to live a pure life, it's to have a relationship with Jesus, all kinds of vague generalities that are stabbing at the concept but show no understanding of what we've done in this class. And if when you come to that question, what is the meaning of holiness or sanctification, what is a holy life, if you don't have the concept of separated, then you haven't learned, you haven't, you haven't caught on. You've just endured the class, and uh, it's like water off a duck's back. And that's sad, because holiness is a very important biblical subject, and no one gets to heaven without being holy. And if you don't know what holy is, you just have this vague idea, uh, shame on you. You've had, uh, you were forced, you were persecuted, whatever word, blessed, however it affected you, to have a whole semester in Doctrine of Holiness where we've talked about the key terms and given you an opportunity to ask anything you want to ask about the subject. And by this time, the basic meaning of holiness and sanctification ought to be so familiar that you could just the reflex, uh, what does holy mean? It means to be separated to God and from sin. What does sanctification mean? It means to be separated to God and from sin, the basic idea of holiness and sanctification. Separation. Do you have any questions on, on that? I'm hoping that the word holy is no longer the super deluxe model of a Christian in your mind, that you would not be comfortable looking in the mirror and saying, you're holy. I hope you understand that holiness is derived from relationship. That to be holy, you have to be connected to the source of holiness. That's what we say separated to God as his possession. There is no holiness if you're not in personal relationship with God. But if you are in personal relationship with God, then by definition, you are holy. And you need to know that that is the primary biblical term that the Holy Spirit has chosen to refer to followers of Jesus. Holy 
ones, holy ones. And therefore, you and I are required, if we're going to profess to know Jesus, to be holy. So, this to be holy, the idea of live a holy life, well, we, we, we talked about the start. You have to be connected. And you're connected when you repent, connected to the source of holiness. There's only one source, God himself. There's no such thing as his holiness, the Pope. Unless the Pope is a born-again believer. People may use that term, but it's not being used in a biblical sense. His holiness, the head of the Buddhist temple. And biblically, that's not holy. The only those who are connected into a personal relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ are said to be holy. And once we get connected through the new birth, then we have to learn, learn the language, the manners, the behavior of holiness. And I talked to you about the concept of adoption. Every believer at the moment we get saved is adopted into the family of God. And so what is the what are the What's the language that comes out of a newly saved individual? What are their manners, behavior, goals? How do they relate to other people? Well, they, for the most part, relate, and all of this is answered just like before they were saved. The only change that would happen is if a person knew something was wrong, and you have to know something's wrong in order to get saved. Why, why pray a sinner's prayer if you're not a sinner? You don't feel like you're a sinner, you don't need God, then you're not a Christian. But people get saved, truly saved, without any Knowledge of how to behave, how to talk, uh, how to live. And so, this is where the Bible, the Bible and you, that you led somebody to the Lord. Is that okay? You need something break? You got it? Please get it. That sounded serious. Mentor. How do you mentor? I wouldn't, you say, I wouldn't know how to mentor somebody in holiness. Well, where do you think your notes that I give you are all about? Your notes are a source for discipling somebody. Christian belief notes. In your doctrine of holiness notes. And if you haven't kept your notes and put them someplace where you can access them, then no, you won't know what material to use. You won't know how to mentor someone. And that would be unspeakably sad. When I am mentoring you in this class, it's not a voluntary mentoring on your part. It's a required part of the Bible core here. Everyone has to take Doctrine of Holiness. This is the only shot we get try to help people start using terminology properly. We don't, we're not trying to make critics out of you. We're not trying to have you find fault with people who have never had the privilege of taking a course called Doctrine of Holiness, where you're taught the proper use of terms. I hope nobody would criticize me for not knowing much about 
physiology as a person who took a course in physiology. If you don't have the data, haven't been exposed to the data, if you don't know the proper terms, if you don't know how systems within the body work, you don't know. It's not because you don't want to know. You haven't had opportunity, and it's, it's not been available. Here's opportunity. What does it mean to be holy? To be holy requires that you be born again. To be holy means you have to be separated to God as his possession. To God as his possession. What does that mean? That means you're not your own anymore. You're not in charge. You are bought with a price. You belong to the Lord. You're his property. And he should have the right to tell you how to live. Yes? I'm hoping when you hear the word holiness and sanctification, you're not thinking about lifestyle, about standards, about uh, how what you do with your hair or how you dress. Holiness, that's not, that's not holiness. That's biblical data for people who are saved trying to learn how to dress and please God. That's what that's all about. That's not holiness, except in the broadest sense that people who are holy seek to obey Scripture. The bottom line of a person who professes to be holy, the bottom line is they're striving by God's grace to be kind to other people, forgiving other people just like God has forgiven them. Kindness is in a short commodity we who are learning the Bible should learn that holiness, the goal of holiness is to become the goal. Not the definition, the goal of holiness is to become more like Jesus. Jesus is the example. Jesus was kind to people. The only people Jesus ever spoke that somebody could call harsh, and I sincerely doubt that's the proper term to use. I think it was truth. I think it was kindness to warn the religious leaders, not the lay people. The religious leaders who believed that they knew everything necessary to be, to go, to be teachers. And Jesus spoke very bluntly to them. Then some people want to say, well, Jesus spoke, criticized these people, so I think I have a right to be like Jesus. Well, I want you to remember that Jesus said, the words I speak are what the Father wants me to say. I say nothing on my own initiative. The Holy Spirit told Jesus what to say. Is the Holy Spirit telling you what to say that's negative about somebody else? I was horrified when I heard that out of the 12 preachers at IHC, one of the preachers irritated some people and so on Facebook comes their complaints and their criticism about one of those preachers. That isn't Christ-like, that's not kind, that's not gracious, that's not Christian. Why do professed Christians act that way? I 
I suppose the kindest thing I can say is they are plum ignorant of what it means to be kind to other people. They have no clue. They think that I have a right for free speech and I can express my opinion. And if it's not kind and if it's not gracious and if I'm attacking a fellow Christian, it's fine because I'm all about truth. And I don't think people ought to do this and that and this way and that way. Well, why don't these people go talk to the person personally? Because they're moral cowards. It takes guts to go and express personally to the speaker your concern. And it takes spiritual wisdom to know how to express it in the way you'd like somebody to express their disagreement with you to you. Students, I want you to think about what you do, how, what you say about people, what you post on Facebook or any other social media. Are you setting the example of sweetness and kindness and tenderheartedness? If you're not, then you're conformed to the world in those areas of your life and you need to become biblically minded. Questions or comments? Pushback. Feel free to say whatever you want to say. I'm here and you're here. Say it to my face. Let's talk about this. I have no clue what you do on Facebook because I'm not on Facebook. But I hear from people on Facebook. Leaders in the school tell us what's going on and hope we're not involved, well, Dr. Phil and I assured them we're not even on Facebook, so we're not part of the problem. But there are other formats and forms. We're also not, it's interesting to me, the, the, the person that got the most flack on Facebook and stirred up various people. I was there and heard the person Philip was sitting next to me and heard the person. My grandson was sitting on the other side of Philip and heard the person. I felt sorry, a little sorry for the person because it seemed like they didn't have coherence of thought like they usually did. So I was feeling sorry. felt like he was, the person was kind of getting in the way. I never said a thing to Philip afterward about that, except I felt like he was struggling and getting in the weeds. I felt sorry for him. Usually that person is very coherent, powerful speaker, good. I uh, rated that person as one of uh, the Babe Ruth baseball figures of the Holiness Movement. Whether I agree with everything he says or not, who in the world have you found that you agree with everything you know that, per that says? There, there's no such person we agree with everything unless it's God. And then we sometimes have trouble agreeing with him on, on a few verses, right? And so on the way home, I said, I said, or Philip said, I don't know which one of us said. Grandson was in the back seat, and my personal assistant was in the back seat. He said, uh, Philip, uh, or Alan, Alan's the grandson. Alan, uh, what did you enjoy about IHC? He said, I enjoyed singing in the choir. Well, of course he did. He's still in high school, and he got to sing. There, that was the first time he got to sing it. That was fun, exciting. That's the reason he went. Because he got to stay with us in our motel, and you couldn't go in high school unless you stayed with family. I think that's the rule. And he got to have some. The only reason I went is because Philip made me go. <laughs> <laughs> he scheduled me to speak in another little session. That, uh, <laughs> so, Alan, what did you enjoy most? He said, I enjoyed 
inquire, and then I enjoy so and so sermon, the sermon that got other people upset. I'm listening. Philip's listening. He said, and I could just see in my mind, as that man preached, my dad was sitting there with a smile on his face, nodding his head. Well, that wasn't the case. But as Alan, that's what he thought would be happening. And we never said boo. Who is going to be somebody to minister to one of your children or grandchildren? If you badmouth them in their presence, you will cut the bridge, burn the bridge, put a negative influence in the life of that child or grandchild, and the devil will see to it that that person can't be a blessing to your child or grandchild because you badmouth them over something. Oh, well, you say, oh, I didn't throw him out, the baby with the bath. I was just talking about what I thought was excessive this or uh, whatever. Children and grandchildren don't have that ability to distinguish shades of gray and know that you still respect somebody even if you disagree with them. Do you understand that? I have not heard this particular sermon you talked about, but just in general, I was wondering, how would you suggest like going through something and dissecting it and talking to your children and do it in a way that's kind? something that you disagree with and do it in a way that's kind and respectful but also like okay this is some places that maybe you know this is not something you would agree with and here's the biblical reasons why and just like talk kindly and dissect sermons and classes and things you're working through and when you have disagreements of theology how can you do that without reflecting poorly on the teacher, the pastor, or the professor? Excellent question. Let me suggest to you, you know how your brain tunes out? And you're distracted, and you look down at your cell phone, and you, and you tune out, and then you tune back. You understand that? Now, are you adults? Yes. So the first thing you do is you probe gently to see, find out if they even heard it. They didn't hear it. The men need to correct something they didn't hear. You with me? Let's assume they did hear it. Then you ask them, what did they hear? And so let's say that uh, the person said uh, that uh, you can backslide after you've been saved and go to hell, and you don't believe you can backslide after you've been saved and go to hell. You believe once saved, always saved, no matter how you live. You with me? And then you say, the child says, well, I heard him say you can backslide after you're saved and go to hell. And then you say, well, what do you think of that, hon? What does the Bible say? And then you bring out I don't know. Then you would have them turn in their Bible to book, chapter, and verse to your favorite verses that you think teach once saved, always saved, no matter how you live. You follow me? And then you would talk to them about why this teaches once saved, you're always secure, no matter what. Vice versa. I heard him say, Daddy, that once saved, always saved. Well, is that true? I don't think so. Well, what we always check what someone says with the Bible. And so let's get our Bible. Now, if you don't know where things are found, you felt persecuted and tormented and wished I wouldn't ask you where things are found in this book. I did it for a purpose. I was never asked that in Bible college. And when I went to grad school and got around people who knew where things were in their Bible better than I did, I felt ill-equipped and began to resent the faculty members who taught me in Bible college that they taught me 
concepts, theology, right belief, but never tied it to book, chapter, and verse. And these guys were laying book, chapter, and verse of their theology that I disagreed with, and I would say, well, I disagree with that. Well, why? Show me in the Bible why. Well, somewhere in there it says, well, whoop de do somewhere. Now, I never would have felt the need to know book, chapter, and verse had I not been humiliated by fellow classmates who knew where things were located better than I did, and I disagreed with their theology. They showed me their verse. I couldn't show them my verse. I remember fuming about that inside. I'd get home, pull my theology books off my shelf, and I'd look through, and they'd have a bunch of references, and so I'd start looking them all up, and that made me fume all the more, because quite a few of those didn't really address what their, what did they even put them there when it's not talking about what the subject, you understand, I don't know, you've never had that experience. Children are very, very, very precious, and you want to teach them properly. So you don't badmouth the person. You talk about the concept. And, and let the person go. Does that make sense? Other questions? You know, we are so verbal. We have no persecution. Uh, nobody's listening and going to report to the authorities well, what we said, and we'll come and be arrested and taken. We're, we have no guards at our lips. We have no sense of uh, this is, this, what comes out of our mouth is important, and God's going to hold us accountable for every word that we speak. We have no fear of that. Consequently, I feel I have a right to express my opinion. Free speech. I'm not trying to criticize them as far as a person I just totally disagree, think it was totally wrong. You're influencing other people. Is that how you want them to talk about you when you try to teach something? This is not easy. It's not easy to talk about other people like we'd like to be talked about behind our back. It's not easy to be tuned into being careful, little tongue, what you say. When the Father up above is looking down in love, be careful, little tongue, what you say. Many times we're not careful. And if somebody asks you, are you trying to be mean? I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. And we're sincere about that. But what are we? We're being unbiblical in what we're doing. So you didn't have to try to be mean to be unbiblical. You're just being unbiblical. Questions or comments? How many understand what I'm talking about? This is a problem. It will be a problem you will face the rest of your life, controlling your tongue. It was a challenge to me, and it's still a challenge on some occasions to keep my mouth shut when I feel so strongly in a negative sense about what somebody has said. I want to keep my conscience clear before God, you know. If other people are going to violate scripture, that's their business. God will deal with them. Don't know what's going to happen to them. I want to keep my conscience clear. I hope you want to keep your conscience clear. So if you're asked, what is it? what does it mean to be holy? It means to be separated unto God as his possession. It means also to be separated from, to God, from that which is sinful. We've talked about we become holy at the moment of 
we're saved. Can you prove that? Yes. I've given you 1 Corinthians 1-2 as the primary proof of that. Where he calls people who are saved sanctified to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. All Christians are sanctified. Okay, so I heard preachers talk about entire sanctification but using the word sanctified. I didn't sit there with a sneer in my heart and the proverbial invisible curled lip of criticism. I just was sorry that the people asked to preach don't know how to use the terminology correctly. It reflects on our movement. It doesn't bring credit. And we are basically very nice people. We're trying to be serious Christians. We're trying to love Jesus and be Christ-like. I have no doubt that that's the desire of the majority of the people. At least I hope it is. I'm given the benefit of the doubt. How would I know? Why not say it? Most likely is. But we don't want to come across as ignorant, do we? Well-intentioned, lovely, ignorant people. Uneducated people. Please, if you're going to talk about further working of God's grace after you're saved, and what are the passages that talk about God's desire for people after they're saved, give me passage. Romans 12.1. Romans 12.1. And what does Romans 12.1 say to Christians? That's right. Calls for a full surrender or a full consecration of themselves to God after they're saved. We'll give you another passage. First Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. And what's this passage say? Yes, it's a prayer. May the God of peace himself. Talking to Christians. This isn't for sinners. May the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through, completely, entirely. New American Standard says entirely. Meaning all of you, spirit, soul, and body. And preserve you blameless till he comes. Is that possible? Verse 24. First of all, and the word preserve says, yes, you can be preserved. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. This is subsequent to being born again. What's another passage? Subsequent to being born again. Ephesians 5, 18. Thank you. Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. And what does that passage teach? Be filled with the Spirit. Yes, be filled with the Spirit. So what do you call? What do you call this after salvation that God wants to accomplish in your life? Well, you can just stay with what the passage is saying. This would be a full and uh, Baptist preachers typically want to use consecrated. Consecration, that's fine. Consecrate means to sanctify to God, set apart for God. Uh, full surrender, whatever. I, it doesn't matter to me what terminology, if it's there in the text. I don't like it when people want to talk about entire sanctification 
and are using this passage, if people are following along, following in their Bible, they won't find the phrase entire sanctification there, will they? So why, why confuse people? Just stay with what the passage says. You want to talk, use the entire sanctification terminology, then go to this passage. You want to talk about being filled with the Spirit? It won't go to that passage. You say, well, what's the difference in the experience? And the answer is nothing. It just being talked about a little bit differently. Basic same idea. In every one of them, there is Yielding full control to God, right? Full, after you're saved, giving God full control of your life. What's another passage we talked about? Romans 6 11. Come again? Romans 6 11. Thank you. Romans 6 11. Let's take it on down through 13. This one says, reckon yourselves indeed to be dead. It means really believe and put into action. Count it so. And then this one says, stop yielding the members of your body as instruments of unrighteousness, but yield the members of your body as instruments of righteousness. That word yield and present, same Greek word. It's talking about to Christians what they need to do subsequent to understanding who we are and Romans 6, 1 through 10 explain who we are because of our connection with Jesus. We are united with Christ in his death, burial, resurrection. We're freed from the power of sin. We're not to continue in the acts of willful known sin. But we are rather now, after we understand who we are, we're to truly believe what God says about us is true and then act like it. Live it out. What's another passage? Pardon? We didn't do that one in this class. That's a good one. But let's stick with the ones we did in this class. What's another passage? Yes. Psalm 51. Yes. What What did we do with Psalm 51? Why did we even go to Psalm 51? Yeah. Good. So... Where do we get the prayer for forgiveness of sins committed? Psalm 51. What verses in Psalm 51 deal with the pattern to repent of sin? Look in your Bible. Tell me what verses deal with the pattern. If you want to know how to repent, what verses does Psalm 51 teach us how to repent of our sins? Sir, you started in the right spot, but you encompass too much. What? You're really close. Drop off a verse. Go backwards. Yeah. Repentance for sins, one through four. One through four. Then what starts in verse 5? What does he say? Somebody read verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Okay, starting at verse 5, he's going back, way back to the moment of his conception. That's not about sins committed. This is before he was even born. So verses 5 through 8 
is going to deal with, he's going to talk about mankind's basic problem. And what is mankind's basic problem? It was what caused him to sin with Bathsheba. What is it that he wanted? Book, chapter, and verse. Tell me what the basic verse is. tells us the problem. It's not in Psalm 51. Thank you. The problem we used, we found, was Isaiah 53, 6. And why did we use that reference. What does that verse say that would cause me to use this reference to deal with what everybody's problem is? We all but sheep have gone astray. We have each turned to his own way. That second part, we have each turned to his own way, explains why we all go astray. We want our own way and that's our basic problem he talks about it at the moment of conception I was messed up how was I messed up I wanted my own way and what in Isaiah 51 5 what two words does he use to describe that condition every every Whenever there's conception, that cellular division that begins making the embryo, what's the spiritual status of that forming child? Verse 5, there's two words. Louder? Are you looking at verse 5? One of the words is sin. What's the other word? Iniquity. What's the difference between sin and iniquity? It's amazing how many times I can say things in your presence. It's like throwing mud on a wall and it all falls off. I'm trying to throw a little more on the wall, see if anything. I wish all of you would write that in your mind. Sin is missing the mark. It's the broadest general term. What's the mark? The mark is God's word. When you fail to do what God's word is, that's sin. This is the mark. And then iniquity. Iniquity is crookedness. Turn, you know, if the Bible says that these three tile squares across the path, Christian to walk on. That iniquity is that crookedness that makes me turn off the path of the straight and narrow and be crooked at the wrong turn. We come from the womb. Missing the mark and twisting spiritually. Not a very nice picture, is it? All righty. Thank you for coming. We will continue reviewing. I hope you're writing these notes down. I hope you're getting things down. This is our last chance to get things straight.